Welcome to Trash Compactor. I'm Josh, and this week is a bonus episode. Once again, we're presenting an episode that was a part of the Secret Origins of Mint Condition, our cousin podcast. And this was a wrap up of Obi Wan Kenobi um, after the conclusion of the series, about a month after it finished, and ahead of the debut of the next Star Wars series that's dropping, Andor. I thought that this would be a good conversation to post in the Trash Compactor feed because yeah, it touched on a lot of things that we didn't get to in the Obi-Wan Kenobi wrap-up that we did, the reaction episode to episode six. And I want to thank James, the host of Secret Origins, who I happen to have here with me. Hello, James. Hello. First off, thanks again so much for letting me repost these Star Wars episodes that you did for Secret Origins on the Trash Compactor feed. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, I appreciate you reposting them. I mean, they're, they're, I, I'm happy you've been a part of those conversations, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, spread whatever Star Wars knowledge and thoughts we have to anyone else who wants to listen. So thank you. <laughs> so I just wanted to record a, a brief intro before we go into the episode that we did for Secret Origins about Obi-Wan, because since then, the making of show about Obi-Wan Kenobi has been released on Disney Plus. I think it was called Return of a Jedi. Uh, yeah, that sound right? That sounds right to me. Uh, what did you think of it? Uh, was there anything that you saw in it or anything that anyone said that 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 stuck out? I love the whole thing. I I feel like it was a little I would have liked it to be a little longer. Uh I know Disney Plus seems to do their behind the scenes thing um a lot shorter these days. But I know when they first started doing like behind the scenes of the First season of Mandalorian, we got like nine episodes, and now we're kind of getting just one or two episodes. But aside from the, and I, I only want it to be longer because I really enjoyed everything that the actors and the people behind the scenes were saying. Um, I especially enjoyed that a lot of the thoughts you've spoken about on your podcast, you know, reaction shows to the whole thing, were expressed by the by the people making it. And so I'm glad we like kind of picked up on that. And um, and what we discussed in sort of the wrap up of Obi Wan Kenobi, I mean. Aside from the fact of all those thoughts that we got to experience and, and see the actors actually say, um, I was also happy that one of the things we talked about in this podcast, Ewan McGregor talked about directly about the fact that Obi-Wan, why he left Darth Vader, lived. Like, it came out. Like, he said that his reasoning. And I thought the reasoning was kind of online with what we were talking about in the episode. So that was sort of nice to hear that, you know, everything we were thinking they were saying, they were saying was very... Um, I guess, you know, fulfilling, I guess, in a way, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very satisfying to hear that like, we were on yeah. the right track. Like we were, yeah. it's like, we picked up what was in there. Like we weren't reading into it. Yeah. And I would say, and I think we said this on the podcast on the wrap up podcast you're about to repost, but or maybe you even said it, but this really showed me that as, as much as I love Alec Guinness, Ewan McGregor is Obi-Wan Kenobi. I mean, I, I'm sorry, anyone listening who might be taking offense to that, but his joy and enthusiasm during, you know, the making of special was, was really genuine. And he really enjoyed the role. And I think it really is the essence of Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> I agree with you, too. And there was this uh, really stunning moment. Uh, they did this really interesting thing with the volume where they played clips from the films on the volume and they filmed the actors watching them sort of larger than life. I think it even starts out, you have Ewan McGregor looking up at Alec Guinness's first appearance as Obi-Wan in A New Hope. And it's just this love that they all have for those movies and those characters. And I was also really, I really loved seeing how much love and affection and really gratefulness that not just Ewan McGregor, but also Hayden Christensen has for these iconic characters that they play and are and sort of inhabit. Like and seeing them, like their relationship, they really seemed like they have such love and affection for each other that that, you know, mirrors the relationship that their characters have. And I just thought that like the the love that they had for each other and just the how thankful they are to have the opportunity to revisit this after almost 20 years and be those characters again together and how special that was. Like, you know, you really feel the love in this one, I thought. No, definitely. And it's kind of like, you know, whatever fandom thinks of the prequels. And I, I understand also like the prequels were some people's Star Wars that they, as they said many times in the making of, and, and also we, obviously we know from fandom, but, you know, I feel like with a chance also for the two of them, you and Aiden to, 
you know, really dig into the characters, like you said. They get to, you know, we've talked about on our podcast and your podcast, my time, like George Lucas was not interested in them being overly emotive or deep in the acting process of being those characters. But now they got to do, do that. So, which is very rare for an actor, I guess, to get a second bite in the apple, let alone like Hayden Christensen, which I think, um, I think he took a lot of harsh criticism and I, I'm just speculating. I think it was a really gave him probably some closure on the whole Anakin Skywalker role. <laughs> no, I agree. So I don't know if they say it in this documentary specifically, but it has come out subsequently that Deborah Chow, the director, said when she was hired, Darth Vader wasn't in the story. And she said that, you know, she just felt it was really important that if we're going to revisit this period with you and as Obi-Wan, that she just felt like it was really important to have Hayden involved. And that's kind of when it became a Vader and Obi-Wan story or an Anakin and Obi-Wan story, which in retrospect, like, like, it's always interesting just hearing the process of how something was arrived at when in retrospect, the end product is like, well, how could it have been any other way? Like, <laughs> I think I said this in the episode, like this for me is really is either episode 3.5 or the, the alternate episode four where Obi-Wan is the main story. Uh, like th these scenes where we see Obi-Wan learning that Anakin is alive and that he's Vader and confronting him as Vader and letting go of that, like the idea that that all happens off screen is wild now that we've seen it. Right. Which is, you know, again, it, I, again, why I kind of like the show now that we're thinking about this <laughs> again, you know, like more time away from it is, uh, it's sort of like the thing I've said about a lot of things in pop culture when they come out is I'm looking for the thing to be something I didn't know I wanted, but now can't imagine not having. So I yeah. didn't know I wanted to see the story. I didn't, I didn't know I wanted to see the moment where, you know, Obi-Wan realized Darth Vader was still alive or I did, I didn't know how much I wanted to see the duel before the duel in the new hope. But now that we have it, I was like, wow, I can't imagine we would have never gotten this. <laughs> Seems strange. <laughs> The other thing that was very satisfying was the thing that Chris, that we spoke up on the wrap up and you spoke on the last show is like, they admitted that the emperor talking to Vader made him the Vader that we wanted it in the, in the original trilogy. I was like, yes, they did. They said that. <laughs> That's what their intent was. <laughs> oh yeah. They did say that. No, you're right. In like fact, we theorized that, that, that it made the transition from that Darth Vader to this Darth Vader, but that was their intent was to make the transition from this Darth Vader to that Darth Vader. <laughs> Uh, you're right. Yeah, we do say that. By the way, I'm just thankful that it, Disney recognizes that for a lot of people, the making of are as much a part of Star Wars for a lot of fans that, you know, they're even going through the trouble to create these behind the scenes looks at these shows. I wish like the Mandalorian one was the, like, he got a whole bunch of episodes. I wish, I wish this had been at least two or three episodes, but I'm glad they're doing them though. I think you put it, you put it perfectly that I didn't know that I needed this. And now that we have it, I'm just so thankful that we do have it. And thank you again for allowing me to repost this wrap up of Obi-Wan Kenobi from Secret Origins and Condition. And without further ado, here is the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Secret Origins of Mint Condition. I am one of your hosts, James, and with me is Chris. Hey, y'all. And joining us today is a guest who is uh, the, one of the hosts of the Star Trek version of this podcast, but the host of his own podcast, Trash Compactor, a Star Wars podcast. Returning uh, guest, Josh Bernhard. Hello there. And uh, we're going to talk about a show that nobody has any thoughts about and no one's ever heard of. Obi -Wan I was going to say, I don't know if anybody's heard of this show. It's going to yeah, be tough in an audience, you know, I think. I know, I know. I really wanted to speak about this, the show that nobody's ever had any thoughts. Really deep dive on this character. Yeah, deep, yeah, deep dive on this character. So so we're, we're, we're you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi ended, what, about a month ago from the time of this recording, I guess? It's about a month? Almost. A yeah, month. about that. So we've had, uh, you know, Chris and I have had a chance to, I guess, you know, reflect on it. I guess, uh, Chris, I'll open it up to you since uh, last, you know, we spoke a few episodes ago. You gave some of your thoughts on the series at the time. So what were, what are your overall thoughts on Obi-Wan Kenobi? Sure. I really enjoyed the hell out of it. Um, I, I really liked it. I thought the, again, I was absolutely, <laughs> I was absolutely tickled when, uh, when I realized, oh, and for anybody who doesn't know already, it should be obvious, but spoilers ahead. Um, 
you know, I was absolutely tickled by by the the bait and switch they pulled. Uh, and instead of this being a Luke story, it was Mount Leia. So I, I loved that. I thought it tied up a lot of loose ends in terms of why does Leia feel as though we want to be trusted with with the blueprints for the Death Star and A New Hope? Um, why does she name her son Ben? Um, there are all these these reasons that uh, it had also added a dimension to even something that uh, the three of us talked about in uh, Josh in your uh, A New Hope episode of Trash Compactor was this notion that like, you know, Alderaan had just been destroyed, but here Leia is instead of grieving she, and, and mourning, she's she's comforting Luke who lost a, who lost a man who entered his life 23 hours prior. Um it's now we know it's because she understands what he's lost, even if he doesn't, you know? Um, so I, I overall, I really, really enjoyed it. Any problems I had came, came a little bit earlier in the series. Some of them were tied up, some of them, not so much. Um, but I think that as a whole, after I finished watching it, I was like, this is, this is one series I will go back and rewatch in its entirety and treat it like a, like a film. So I thought it did. I thought it did really, really terrific work. I thought the actors did a lot of the, the heavy lifting. Um, yeah, I really, I just really, really enjoyed it. And I have heard, like, I've heard criticism of it. And not that I'm not open to, like, having some of those conversations, but I, I actually personally don't have any room for negativity regarding this, regarding this series. And by that, I mean, not criticism, but, but you know, this wasn't the Obi-Wan I know or, you know, retcon, blah, blah. I just, I don't have the room for the negativity because I just, I just enjoyed it too much. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you. Um, Josh, you did six episodes on this. You've had some time away from recording about it. So what are your thoughts now having a little bit, a month's space since it came out and talked about it last? Well, we actually only did five episodes because if you recall, uh, Disney Plus dropped the first two episodes at once. So there were only yeah. five. Oh, five yes, weeks. yes. Yes, okay. but I apologize. That's, that's just the pedant in me. Um, <laughs> No, I echo Chris's sentiments. I I loved it. I enjoyed the hell out of it. I'm glad it exists. I um, and just because it's top of mind, because it was the last thing you said. There are you know things that you could dissect and get a little critical about, but I just don't have the desire to really delve into that too much. I think you know possibly because of the amount of toxicity that exists in the Star Wars fan space, especially online. It could be a reaction to that. It it could also just be, you know, like it's hard to make things. And when you get so much right, it just seems somehow unsportsmanlike to 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 focus <laughs> so much on the like small things you quote unquote got wrong. Um, and again, even like I say, like, like, I don't think that this show did anything wrong. Like any of my critiques are really more quibbles or personal aesthetic things. And actually, I do like having had the time away from it to kind of sit with it. And honestly, I don't think my thoughts about it have changed so much. I, um, one thing that I will say, Chris, you were talking about how there were some things in this show, particularly with Leia, who was fantastic, by the way. I want to commend the actor's yeah, name, who's, um, whose name, of course, escapes me because I'm turning into an old man and I, I no longer have the capacity to uh, recall names. Um, but <laughs> it looks like it was Vivian Lyra Blair. Yes, yes. She, yes, she knocked it good. out of the park. She, she was 100%. She, she was so great. She was so great. At, and the interaction between her and Ewan McGregor, who, by the way, like this show is the Ewan McGregor show. Like he showed everybody why he is Obi Wan. This is a thing I can't believe I'm about to say. He's the definitive Obi Wan Kenobi now. I think that's fair though. He's played it the longest. I mean, yeah. he's played it the longest, but he's also it's not just in terms of the the amount of screen time. Like his depiction is the richest, the most nuanced. He changes the most. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love Alec Guinness, I love Bridge Over the River Kwai, I love him in Lawrence of Arabia, even though the the blackface is, is not so great. Putting it like me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love the BBC version of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, like that's like one of my all-time favorite pieces of media in general. So like, so I love me some Alec Guinness, and I love the original Star Wars, but, but I would venture to say that this cements Ewan McGregor as the definitive Obi-Wan Kenobi. Well, and mind. sometimes we've talked about this in previous episodes about other things that sometimes you need to separate the artist from the art, right? You need to separate the artist from the craft. But there's still part of me that that is sometimes disappointed to learn a thing about 
um, about an artist. And, you know, in, in, in the case of Alec Guinness, it's that, you know, he regretted playing Obi-Wan Kenobi. And, and, and despite how much hate was heaped on the prequels, despite how uh, difficult that must have been for Ewan McGregor to deal with, he was excited to come back to this character and he clearly really likes and loves the character. And, and for me, that also puts him a step ahead of fair or not for me personally, that puts him a step ahead of, um, of Alec Guinness as well, because he, he wants to be here. You know, he's the guy who wants to be here at the end of the day. And, and I, and that's something that I really, I'll admit, I want that out of, um, the artists who create the, the things I care about. They get into that a lot in, um, in galaxy quest. Right. In the movie Galaxy yes. Quest, they get into, um, you know, just how important it is to some of us that, that, you know, this happened in this episode, that happened in that episode, and it matters that you get it right. And it can be very disillusioning when, when the person that we respect, you know, don't meet your heroes, the person we respect and we enjoy as this character turns out to, to have that kind of a disconnect with the, the property we so love. So, so yeah, I, I'd agree with that assessment that he is, he is the definitive Obi-Wan Kenobi. And, for me, part of it is the personal behind the scenes stuff, because he also, you know, there was also that element of, um, um, oh gosh, what's her, what's her name? The, the, uh, Moses Ingram, who got yeah. all that, you know, racist bullshit. Oh, yeah, that's, that's and McGregor garbage, yeah. was one of the first people to, to step yeah. up and yeah. end up against it. And that matters to me. He, I think as soon as he heard about it, like he went in his car, he got on his phone, he recorded a video, he sent it to the Star Wars social accounts. And like he said, in no uncertain terms, like if you are one of these people, you are not welcome here. And that yeah. that was yeah. that was really um, refreshing to see. And I also have to give the people running the Star Wars social accounts a lot of credit. Like it seems like they learned from their experience in the past years and they decided that either ignoring it or just deleting it wasn't an option. And they really had to be proactive and to engage with it head on and sort of leave no quarter. And that is something that I, I noticed and I really appreciated. Um, just a couple other things I want to say before I forget. Um, similar to you, Chris, we had mentioned in that episode of Trash Compactor about the weirdness of that moment of Leia consoling Luke and how and how yeah. Obi Wan Kenobi uh, kind of gives that some new context. Similarly, in the episode we did on this show about the redemption of Darth Vader, I think I think I spoke at length about how one of my main problems with even really answering that question about whether Darth Vader is redeemed or not is that that I have a hard time connecting the Hayden Christensen version of Anakin Skywalker with the Darth Vader slash Sebastian Shaw at the end of Return of the Jedi depiction of the character that we see in the original trilogy. Essentially, like it was hard for me to see, to feel them as the same character in my mind. Sure. And yeah, and yeah. this show, this show went a long way to unifying the two depictions of the characters in my mind. Like now when I watch the original trilogy, uh, before, I don't think I was really ever thinking that that was Hayden Christensen under that suit. But now this show kind of bridges the gap for me in a way that I really I didn't think was even possible or not that it wasn't possible. I just never thought it would happen. So it right. was really nice to see. Um, the other thing like this for me really is sort of like an episode 3.5 like this this story like if you imagine the Star Wars movies were made in chronological story order rather than first the original trilogy and then the prequel trilogy 20 years later. You know, if you imagine the prequels were made first, there is a version of this story where it, uh, the main character is not Anakin Skywalker. The main character is really Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this series could have been in episode four and actually makes a lot of sense if you think about how you would have continued writing the story if you had started at episode one two three um you would you would just feel like the follow-up movie would need to depict these moments where obi-wan realizes that anakin's alive that is a moment that i never knew how much I needed to see but then once I saw it it blows me away that that was not a part of the saga the other moment which I've made a case for on my show and I know I'm jumping around here the moment after 
the second duel between Obi-Wan and Vader on that, that like rock planet, when Obi-Wan cuts through Vader's mask and you can see Anakin's face and he sees his brother for the first time in however many years. And he says, I'm sorry, Anakin, for all of it. And then Vader says to him, I'm not your failure, Obi-Wan. You didn't kill Anakin. I did that 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 moment was one of the most I think the most emotional genuinely emotional and also creepy moment in all of Star Wars oh yeah I mean I I agree I mean to um not to again pipe up our own episode but the redemption of Vader um episode that we did like that I was like our our thoughts about Vader and what we are thinking that episode like he he's I mean, he said, we, I, he's, not re, he's not redeemable at the end of Jedi after I saw in Kenobi. It just kind of reaffirms the thoughts that I had at the end of that episode. No, that's but, true also. They really, they doubled and tripled down on the fact that he killed those kids. I mean, like, there was a small part of me that was like, are they going <laughs> to, are they going to do it where he doesn't kill the, these young Padawans? Me and too, said, me too. It takes them but, to be like future Sith Lords. And I'm like, no, 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 they, they went for it. They, no, he, they he pulled, killed, he, they he killed pulled those no children. punches. He killed those kids. Yes, he did. He did. I'm, I'm glad they did that, though. And the, the planet you're talking about is Malachor 5, I think. Oh, um, Malachor 5. Yes. Malachor 5. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad they didn't pull the punch there. I'm glad he, there's, there's a certain satisfaction for me anyway that came with him, with him taking responsibility for the actions because he also, the way he says it, part of the reason it's creepy, right, is because he's taking pride in it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of affirmation there, both for Vader as you know, this wasn't an accident. I made a choice, which I mean, you know, it, it had to have felt like he's being strung along by the Jedi. And later on, we find out he's being strung along by Palpatine. So for him to have the agency to kill Anakin on his own kind of thing, that, that, that has to be, excuse me, affirming for him. And then it's affirming for Obi-Wan, not that it makes things better, but it wasn't, it wasn't his fault. He's not the one who did it, even though he knows that he, he contributed, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the things you're saying, especially what you said about it being episode 3.5. Um, you know, as much as I, I, and I do, I absolutely love, love, love Rogue One. Um, but we don't need Rogue One for this story. For the story of the three trilogies, we don't need yeah. Rogue One, just like we don't need a lot of the other materials. I think to really tell this story, we actually, like, I didn't think we needed Rebels, but I did think that we needed... Um, Clone Wars after watching it I think we need Obi-Wan Kenobi to tell this story yeah yeah I would I would I, Obi-Wan Kenobi really like you said it, it fills in a lot of the gaps that we didn't realize we needed to see until we saw them and it it makes the you know it sort of it can it, it it sort of um I guess unifies the Vader timeline a little bit in terms of all the different actors and people who have played them and it really like gives Obi-Wan his, you know, place into how he gets from the end of episode three to episode four and is is the Jedi master that we originally fell in love with. I mean, that's that's the Jedi. That's how he becomes the epitome of being a Jedi that we see in episode four is, is through this this journey that we got to see in his series here. Uh, just one really quick thing that just occurred to me, that scene that I was talking about that you were just referring to as well, Chris, where where Anakin is finally is taking responsibility for what he did. That is arguably one of the weaknesses of, I think, Revenge of the Sith, is that it's never really clear why he's doing it. Like, like oh, absolutely. He, like, yeah. like, was yeah. he hoodwinked? Like, is he lying to himself? Like, it just feels like he made some bad decisions without thinking. And that happens and, really fast, too. We don't yeah. see as much development as we need to to go, oh, man. Like, it's, it's not, because it's not a fall. Right. To see the fall, we really need to see at least at least some of the build up. We need to see, you know, it needs to be Macbeth here at least. We yeah, need to see yeah. some of the build to the fall. So there's a height from which to fall. But but we never really get that with Anakin. We we never yeah. really get the the climb for the fall. Right, exactly. Which we've talked about at length, I think, on the Darth Vader redemption episode. But, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so I love that moment for the reason you state for the reason that it's it's creepy as fuck it's so unnerving like when he says that like you can see the glimmer the the glint of a smile on his face like he's he's really he's a different person he's evil 
And what I've realized just now is that the whole reason for that scene, for that line, is to correct a continuity error. Because in A New Hope, before even George Lucas knew that Darth Vader was actually Anakin Skywalker once upon a time, when Obi-Wan confronts him, he calls him Darth. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that scene, the reason that the idea for that scene even exists is to really get Obi-Wan to have a reason not to call him Anakin in the next movie. But but it's it says so much about how well they did it uh, that that hardly crosses your mind that that's why it's actually there. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I did. You know, I thought I thought this series in, in a lot of ways was was about a lot of light touches, you know, Um some of it was maybe a little more, a little more heavy handed, but like, but, you know, for example, Leia's insight into, into other people and their motivations, uh, that's, that's her tapping into the force. And so I thought, you know, a lot of the moments they had, the strongest moments they had were, were light touches, the two of, you know, Leia and Obi-Wan bonding and, and holding hands. I loved all that. It's, yeah. That it was great. great even having said what I just said about that Anakin uh, mask moment, some of the most affecting stuff was the stuff between Leia and Obi-Wan, like the the moment where he tells her about her parents and what he got from oh, her so mother good. and what he got yeah. from her father and just that warm relationship. And I loved the end when Obi-Wan returns to the Lars homestead and... yeah. He and Owen sort of, you know, not fully reconciled, but Obi-Wan's like, you know what? You're right. Like, like we have to just let him be a kid and all he needs, like you're all he needs. And then when Owen, he kind of takes a beat and he's like, you want to meet him? It's... Like that, that just broke my heart. That was so beautiful. I was just like, oh my God. Like, like, like I love, I love Owen and Baru so much from this show. Like I love I, them so much. Yeah, I really appreciated what they did there. And also it, it, and maybe this is just me, but it very much read to me as, because again, I, I can't, when I was younger, I think I could watch a lot of this out of context uh, without, without placing it in, in any sort of context. And, and now as I'm older, I can't help but place it in context. And they had that, they had a couple of, a couple of content warnings because of course the, the shooting at Uvalde had just happened and, uh, and they didn't know that when they were filming this. And so they wanted to put it out there, but. But these things don't happen in a vacuum and when we pretend that they do, um, you know, I think that's doing a we're doing the art a disservice and B we're doing the, the consumers a disservice. So I, I very what I very much got out of this and what I really appreciated was this notion of you have a, a father who wants to who wants to spend all of his time with his son and, and not with the daughter. This is not the girl. This is not the child he wanted was the girl. And he ends up with a daughter and he he learns how to love that daughter and he learns enough about it that he's able to let go of the kid he thinks he should have and then because he loosens his grip he's able to meet this child like i'm definitely reading more into it than a lot of other people i think there's there's definitely some projection there because you know it's 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 awful to see kids not be wanted um and so for me part of it was this notion of like you know, learning how to not just stay in your lane. Um, I don't know. This is this is a little bit all over the place, a little a little scattered. But but for me personally, um, his reluctance to go out and and do something about Leia uh, translated into the real world problems of of parents who who favor certain children, especially when it comes to the gender of the child. Um, and and yeah, that was just I don't I don't again I don't know if that was intended or anything, but but. That was something that I got out of this was was a relationship with a child that you didn't necessarily want, but that you got. I, I you know, it also for me, it also had strains of um, as many issues as I have with Orson Scott Card. And, and um, ever since I, I learned about his his he's a he's a raging homophobe. He's a raging homophobe yeah. to the point where he wants to legalize discrimination, you know, yeah. enshrine uh, discrimination against uh, gay people in our laws, which makes him just forget the language makes him a piece of shit human um but in in uh ender's shadow which is you know runs concurrently with ender's game um you know being at some point says to graph you know that you, you didn't want me uh and graph says i was wrong i he you know yeah. says yeah. i was the child you didn't want but got stuck with and graph said yeah i got stuck with you but i was wrong and I got like, I got strains of that in, in this as well. That's interesting. Also, I feel like and this is like a, maybe a separate thing that I'm reading into it. His reluctance to go after Leia was also, I think, just to really point out the level of 
brokenness he's at at that point. Like, yeah, he can't can't leave his cave like he or his little his little life he set up for himself because yeah. he's so broken that aside from maybe he Luke is the more important one in his mind or he feels that way at the time. He's also maybe doesn't have the confidence to feel like he can leave and leave Tatooine and do anything. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah, uh, his depression goes so deep. It's like sort of just like I'm I'm locked in, and that that's all I can do. I, I barely have the energy. If someone attack Luke, maybe I can do something. But I definitely can't. He doesn't leave, even know. The he world. doesn't even. He doesn't even know if he can use the Force anymore. Right. 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 Like, like how how far gone? It's really like I don't know. One of the things that I really appreciated about this show was the depiction of the low point that Obi-Wan is at and the journey that he goes on. There's something that I just really connected with personally, for whatever reason, really resonated with me that, you know, the guilt of thinking you could do something or that you could take on the responsibility. And when you failed, blaming yourself and holding on to the guilt of that having it eat away at you and become become a part of you that for whatever reason really resonates with me and not to get all woo woo but there's um there's a meditation mantra that i heard once um i often think of you know meditation when i think of the jedi uh because i think that certainly like the language is very similar in terms of how to set your mental state and like how to approach the world with certain intentions. But anyway, but there was a, a meditation mantra that I heard once that I think is very powerful and it's forgive yourself for what you didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to do because, you know, with hindsight, you made the wrong call, but in truth, you didn't know. So forgive yourself. For what you didn't understand. You didn't understand what this young child was going to turn into. You didn't understand that despite all of your best efforts, situations would play out the way that he did and he would make the choices he did and that everything would unfold like this. Forgive yourself for what you didn't understand. And I think that, that Obi-Wan, through this show, by the end, has forgiven himself. I actually think that, ironically... When Anakin says, I am not your failure, Obi-Wan, I killed Anakin. I actually think in a weird way, that's when Obi-Wan realizes that this wasn't his fault. I think that Anakin, he's Vader's the one who absolves him of his pain, of his guilt. And I don't think that's his intention. I'm, I'm actually going to take it a step further. Um, I am going to say that that's actually the moment that, that Anakin, while not forgiving obi-wan let's go of obi-wan oh yeah because up until that point like it, it, remember they're on they're on the star destroyer um and i don't remember if it's vader star destroyer devastator but i think it is and the grand inquisitor says we can't break off we can kill the rebel alliance we can't do it for one man and vader says break off and that's exactly yeah. what they do because he cannot help but hunt obi-wan and the emperor calls him on it too right and he says some along the lines of perhaps you're not clear on our priorities. And he says, I am clear. And I think this is the moment when he doesn't forgive Obi-Wan, but he lets go of him. Well, this is sort of a, this is sort of the, the Vader that has the grander perspective of yes. the universe. Like the Vader who we see in A New Hope and that becomes the relentless, going to stop the rebels and empire. Is, yep. that's that's the creation of that vader until mm -hmm. until it realizes luke is alive and everything falls apart and, and the kind right <laughs> and the kind of vader who could have cold anger and not just hot anger yes yes yeah. there's a big difference yeah he, he behaves a lot like kylo ren in that he's always angry so you can tell when he's angry whereas you know by the time we get to a new hope don't get me wrong there's still anger in the very beginning tear the ship apart i want those planets you know found um but there's also the the I find your lack of faith disturbing, right? And yes, he's yeah. clearly angry, but it's a cold anger. It's it makes him more dangerous. Uh, we see it in Empire too. Um, it's I I so I think this is the beginning of when he's like you say, uh, James, when he's able to be the kind of Vader with a broader perspective. He's not just out for revenge, right? He's he's now sort of moving beyond that. Um, and I, and, and I'm good with getting back to that, but, but one other thing, Josh, that you said that really triggered a thought for me and, and you too, James, when you both were talking about how broken Obi-Wan is and, you know, you didn't, you didn't know, you forgive yourself for what you didn't know. 
I also think it's one of the things that I really enjoyed is the fact that um, in general, I like Tala's character. I like Tala's character a lot, but I yeah. like that at every pass, Tala meets Obi-Wan with empathy and that's what he needs. Mm, yeah, she yeah, meets him yeah. with empathy at every single pass, and um, and it's just it's just one of those things where it's it's, I th you know I think we can all agree that we need more empathy in the world, and so when that's what he's met with by her and by and by Bale too, Bale Organa also meets his seeming indifference with empathy. Um, I I it was something that I really really appreciated. Oh, that's well, interesting. Well, I don't know that I saw that 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 was so much empathy coming from uh, from Mr. Organa. I thought I was detecting a little of like snap out of it, old buddy. Like, look, like I need you. I <laughs> that's need you, also, so. but that's but some of that is empathy, right? Because he doesn't do no, it. No, that's in, true. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. do it in an abrasive way. And sometimes, and I think we've all been there. Sometimes we need a shoulder, and sometimes we need a kick in the ass. Yeah, right. But so one of my favorite true. stories that I that I relate. Um, and it's still, it still sort of makes me laugh, but, um, I was, I was, uh, in a, I was working on a, sh on a play in college and I was working with uh, somebody that I'd come to trust as my mentor and my director. And, um, and she'd sort of become like an adoptive, my, like my Jewish mother kind of thing. And, uh, and it was funny because, uh, I was working on this show and I was supposed to, as a, this character, I was supposed to like sort of dance on stage and, and be like kind of slimy and scuzzy. And I, I don't dance or I didn't dance in my life. I, I didn't like doing it. I didn't feel comfortable. I thought I would look stupid, which of course the it's funny because I'm supposed to look stupid. So who cares? I'm playing a character. But I go to my director, uh, who had always been like, who'd been very supportive and very kind to me. And I, I said to her, you know, I was wondering if you could help me with this, you know, and this is at the end of rehearsal. She started looking through her papers and isn't quite looking at me. As I said, I was wondering if you could help me with this part. And she, and she does not say it in a mean way. She doesn't like shut me down or anything. She just very matter of factly while she's collecting stuff says out of, out of, while looking at me at the corner, out of the corner of her eye says to me, sure. What are you doing besides nothing? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, you're, you're right. Like I, it, like <laughs> at one moment, like I'm not giving her anything as a director. I'm not giving her anything to work with. She can't make it up herself. She's not the one on stage. I am. So like, yeah, it sounds really it sounds really cold in that moment, but it wasn't an indictment of my acting ability. It was my indictment or her indictment of, of me not showing up and, and even putting in the effort, not doing the work. So, um, you know, she understood where I was coming from. She understood I didn't want to be embarrassed. Um, so she still met me with empathy, but it was also a firm kick in the ass and like, come on, get out there and do something. No, that's a very good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I, I think that is actually what was going on there. I stand corrected. Well, I and also want to just kind of revisit this idea about where we meet Obi Wan because I, I've you know I've had conversations with a few other people and you know I even thought this myself is the fact that like you know when we meet Obi Wan has been this great hero for all this time um, and especially if you follow him through the Clone Wars and stuff and how you know it's, and it sort of goes to the the issue we had you know you know Chris and and many other Batman people like when Dark Knight Rises like Batman taking time off. You know, he was so defeated that he stopped being Batman. And the, and then we mm -hmm. meet Obi-Wan and he's so defeated that he stopped being Obi-Wan to that point. And, you know, a lot of the back and forth is like, well, if you're if you're a hero on that kind of level, like would it wouldn't the drive to like do something overwhelm your depression or get you out of it? And I think part of, you know, and I was kind of in that, too, because I was I'd be like, if it, in a Batman situation, like that's not the Batman character. And if you've seen Obi-Wan through Clone Wars and through what we saw in episodes one, two, and three, you'd think like Obi-Wan would be sad and broken, but he wouldn't be that broken. But I right. also like, like to point out that for what we saw, at least for Obi-Wan, this is like real failure for him, which is a, is a point to discuss. Like if you've never encountered true failure in your life and you encounter it later in life, it's a big shock. Like it's a shock to the point like you, you may not have coping mechanisms to really like deal with it mentally and emotionally to get yourself out of the hole until something really pulls you out of it. And so that's kind of how that's, I'm looking like Obi-Wan's had a lot of victories in his, in his life and, and, and Anakin arguably in the destruction of the new Re of the old Republic is, is a huge, I, I wouldn't say failure, but it's a huge loss to him that he's never seen it. You know, he's lost a yeah. few battles and he's lost a few friends, but if you've never had like fail, you know, like a lot of people, we, we struggle with things we fail on a normal life, but we're talking about Obi-Wan who's on this, 
you know, I wouldn't say super heroic level, but he's a hero of the old Republic. And uh, this is his first real loss. And that can be really devastating, you know, if you've not really lost that many times in your life. Oh my God. I have so many thoughts about this. Uh, <laughs> that's um, good, James. Get, yeah. What do you got, Josh? Uh, for, first of all, <laughs> the, um, oh, you are certainly right. Like, like, I think it is true that um, this is, and again, I haven't seen Clone Wars. So, so maybe a lot of listeners are going to discount everything I say out of hand from here on out. But, but um, um, uh, uh, he does lose the teen, correct? I mean, Chris, you, you know the series a little bit better than me, but he kind of, he does have feelings for Satine, but it wasn't like overtly shown in the series, unless I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, right. No, I mean, it, it was it was overtly shown in the series. Okay. Um, so it's it, it's a loss, but it it it's <laughs> but it's on it's on par. With, I would argue it's on par with um, losing. OK, so this is this is the parallel I'm going to draw and anybody can feel free to disagree. And if so, let us know in the comments. Um but I think that just like losing Qui Gon is like losing a parent, losing oh, yeah. is like losing a spouse, and the For one sure. that breaks him is the loss of his child, Anakin. Well, child slash brother, Anakin. Oh well, that's interesting. I think that's a very interesting point. That's a very that's a very interesting distinction. Well, because it's one of the things that comes up in in the West Wing. So I was when I was watching the and spoilers for the West Wing. Which I you didn't expect to find here. Surprise, everybody! <laughs> um, but you know, uh, I was when I was watching the the West Wing, and um, somebody that that was staying with me at the time had gotten ahead of me, and so it was at that point where uh, in in I think it was season four when um when um oh gosh, uh, Zoe Bartlett is kidnapped, and there's a there's a uh, gosh now I'm gonna forget what's What's it called when people get together and, and pray? There's a, a something, a gathering, a, a, a vigil, a vigil. Thank you. I just wasn't coming up with the word. There was a vigil outside and I did not know she had been kidnapped because I hadn't seen that far ahead yet. And so I was talking to my buddy, Roger, who, who was a West Wing fan. And he goes, I was like, oh, I thought they had killed her. And he's like, no, they couldn't do that because how do you how does a man like that possibly continue being president? How do you how do you have a show after a man loses his daughter like that? And I was like, all right, that's a really good point. And I think that's sort of the element that happens with Anakin is brother slash child, because that's the one that breaks him. Like a child can get along without their parent when they're when when they're old enough. But a parent never really recovers from the loss of a child. And and, argu and arguably, like, you know, to to the point of like Josh, we're making up him losing Satine. And then we could also say him losing Qui-Gon. He doesn't more that we see on screen or any written thing. He's just like, all right, I'm a Jedi. I got to deal with this. So I lost a teen. I yes, got to keep being a left. Jedi. You know, I, I lost Qui-Gon. I got to train this boy. Qui-Gon wants me to train this boy. So like losing mm -hmm. Anakin could unleash all the mourning that he never did for those relationships in his life too. So, and not only that, so, so I mean, so I mean, first of all, these are all very excellent um, thoughts. And uh, Chris, at some point, let's do a West Wing episode. Uh, I, yes, if that, if, you, I would be all over that. <laughs> Okay. Um, but so not only did he lose his his son, brother, however you want to look at it, but that failure was so catastrophic, it literally destroyed the entire world. The Republic has collapsed. Every planet in the galaxy is now under the thumb of a fascist dictatorship. The Jedi, his entire belief system, his entire professional and personal network has been wiped out that has existed for a thousand generations, like his world is gone. And I think that if you are not used to dealing with failure or loss, something that's several orders of magnitude greater than the loss of a loved one and in terms of scale and ramifications, like wherever he looks, wherever he goes, everything he sees is just a reminder of how colossal his failure was. How, yeah. how, yeah. how devastating for literally trillions of people. This is something that I think, you know, for me, I really understand how that could knock him off his feet and not for nothing. Like, you know, in the grand scheme, he's out of it for like, you know, nine years and he pretty quickly gets his mojo again, like once he's given the opportunity. So, so I sure. think, so I think in the grand scheme, he gets back on the horse pretty quick. <laughs> right. um, yeah. Yeah. I mean. There's only so much horror a person can take, I suppose, right? Yeah. The other thing, though, that I want to respond to what you said, James, about, you know, the nature of heroes. And this is something really fundamental 
that I think really depends on your perspective. I think both you and Joe have very strong ideas about what it means to be a hero or a superhero and like what their reason for existing is to be looked up to uh, as examples and as inspirations and as you know role models like they always are able to persevere like if they have a failure it's like they they may take a moment but then they get back up and i think this idea of what a hero was meant to be i think was really laid bare during all the discourse around the last jedi and the depiction of luke skywalker in that in that movie and i've really been grappling with this whole idea since because for me and again like just in full candor i'm not really one for superheroes like they're not generally speaking characters that i'm attracted to so so maybe that that's the reason why i feel this way but for my money i really appreciate seeing that a hero like an Obi-Wan Kenobi, like a Luke Skywalker, can not only fail, but lose their way, be thrown into a real depression that really turns them into a shell of themselves, makes them into another, yeah. another person. And in all of these examples, we do see them eventually come out of it at the end of the day. But the fact that what that says to me, what I take away from that that I think is so powerful and and very important, actually, for young people to see depicted and understand is that to be a hero and to do good, to do the right thing, you know, it's not something innate. It's not something that just happens. It's a choice that's sometimes hard and you have to continue to meet the challenge to make the choice. And sometimes you don't meet it. Sometimes you stumble. And the fact that that can happen to a Luke Skywalker, that that, that can happen to a Batman or to an Obi-Wan Kenobi, I think says something really important about the nature of goodness and heroism and what it means to be a hero, especially given the fact that in the end, they do come out of it. So I think it would be a different thing if they were broken and they never recovered. But but well, the fact that that we do see them at those low moments and then we see how they get out of it, that that to me is very resonant and I think very profound and very important. Oh, I'm 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 going to agree with you, too. I mean, as much as I like the superhero genre, I mean, I some of my heroes that I love the best are all heroes who are are broken people who have to work. I think hard to, you know, I've, I've made, made mention other podcasts, like, you know, Daredevil's a hero of mine and he berates himself and has loss and Dr. Strange. No, was, that's exactly who I was thinking. Dr. Strange, Dr. Strange. Is, yeah. He's his whole thing is he has to keep working on himself to be a better person to, to be the person he is. Um, when he, well, especially when he has the thing that matters the most to him and that he thinks makes him extraordinary taken away from him. Right. He has, he has a huge loss and he comes back from it and he spent years becoming Dr. Strange. I mean, he went from being Dr. Strange, brilliant surgeon to Dr. Strange, master of the mystic arts. And that was many years of training and being out of the public eye. The, the only, the only thing I was going to add to it, which I don't disagree with you, Josh, is like, um, I do like heroes that are, that have, that can re you know, show that level of humanity that we see on a daily basis. And some of us have, are better dealing with it and overcoming it than others. And that's a whole other separate subject. But I will, I will say most, at least of the stories that in heroic stories, and I think in real life too, the hero usually overcomes it or comes out of it when they try to to interact with other people. I mean, yes. Obi-Wan came out of it because he chose to help Leia finally. That's, that's I'm really glad yes. you mentioned that again, because that was a hundred percent was I what I was going to say is that he Obi-Wan and Luke don't just they don't just bounce back, they don't just come out of it. They have to be guided out of it. And they also have to be in a position to let themselves be guided out of it. So I'm glad right. you that, James. And I would also say just in general, like in real life, at least my personal experience is like when we have a bad time for whatever reason, the inclination is to pull away is, is when we should be reaching out. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's like how any person, let alone a hero overcomes adversity and tragedy and, and loss and suffering is to try to find other people uh, is, is how you get out of it. Yeah. Yes, but that's also one of the insidious things about depression is that all of the things that it makes you want to do are the exact opposite things that you should do to get out of it. No, you're absolutely right. Maybe, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely right about that, Josh. I ran into that with, um, I think I mentioned this on the show before, but but uh, at the height of COVID, I struggled for the first time in my life with depression. With the, And it was situational depression. It was, it was very much based in, it was 
real depression, but it was based in a situation. Um, and I had never really struggled with it before. So, so, so intellectually, I knew what I should be doing. And there were times when all I wanted to do was be around other people. But of course, because of the height of COVID, I couldn't be around uh, people beyond those in my immediate family. Um, yeah. You know, I, I found myself uh, very feeling very attached, very disconnected. And then I wanted to be with people. But then it started, this weird thing started happening where like, I would say, yeah, let's, let's hop on a, on the phone and we'll chat or let's get on a Zoom call or let's play a game online. And as I approached those moments of spending time with other people, I'd suddenly start to feel this dread. Like I didn't want to do it anymore, even though I knew it would be good for me. And, um, and I'd say probably seven and a half out of 10 times I bailed. Um, and so you're absolutely right, Josh, it does this, it does this insidious thing, which I, which I hadn't really experienced before. Um, and thankfully with the, with the help of my family and with the help of therapy, like, I you know, there's still fallout to deal with, but like I'm, I passed that situational depression, but having never experienced it before, even the, even the intellectual knowledge of, I know why I'm feeling this dread and I know I will feel better. If I reach out to people. I still canceled because that was what my, what the depression was telling me to do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and I mean, this is a topic that we can talk to ad nauseum and a shameless plug. We are planning to record an episode of Trash Compactor all about mental illness in Star Wars. So I will save some of my thoughts for that because I would, yeah. Like, to stay, yeah, true. Yeah. I would like to stay on topic here. But um, I mean, we're on a podcast because I wanted to stay in touch with people during all the stuff that was going on with COVID and in my personal situation to yeah. help me stay connected. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's like, you know. Leia kind of saves Obi Wan, even though Obi Wan is ostensibly saving Leia. Yeah, and yeah, Ray Ray saves Luke, even though Luke is ostensibly saving the the Resistance. Um, right, and he's safe where he is. Nobody's going to find him there. But you're absolutely right. Ray ends up Ray Ray landing on his planet is what's and en what ends up saving him. That and then Yoda. Chris, you were talking about, I don't know if you used the word appreciated, but you noted about how the show was really not shying away from dealing with trauma and childhood trauma and, yeah. you know, violence against children, uh, you know, the, uh, the timing of the Uvalde shooting and the premiere of that first episode of Obi-Wan that opens up with the slaughter of the children at the Jedi Temple, like, like was obviously a very unfortunate synchronicity but in retrospect i understand why they couldn't just cut the scene um because that story thread the fact that that origin story that motivation for the creation of what reva became as a as a character as someone who's devoted her life to revenge and will go through whatever ruthless means she needs to get it. She's devoted her entire life to getting revenge and she just hates. So the point that I'm trying to make is that I appreciated and then came to understand why that scene was so integral to understanding the story of the show, really, because Reva is really an extreme example and arguably Anakin, though not depicted as succinctly, but, you know, Reva's really an example of what trauma can do to children and how it affects yeah. them the rest of their lives. And what I really appreciated was at the very end, she makes a choice not to kill Luke. She yeah. makes a choice. She and I forget the exact wording of the scene, but I think that Obi-Wan sort of explains to her the idea that, you know, you don't have to be a monster. You have these horrors inside you, but that's from trauma. That's not your fault. And it, it, it doesn't mean you have to be a murderer. You, you have agency. You, you have agency. And the fact that she when she has the opportunity to do it, she's gotten there. She can do it. Right. And she makes the choice not to be evil that whole storyline that whole idea of how she was formed by her childhood trauma and that it which you know given what the trauma was sadly has a lot of resonance in the world right now but so not only that fact but also the fact that she ultimately realized that she could choose to be something else that she didn't have to be a product of her her past her her trauma she had she had a choice and she made it. And that that was such a 
highlight of the show for me. Like, I think that's a, a fantastic arc that that was just very well handled and very well acted and just, oh, you yeah. know, makes yeah, me definitely. even more angry that Moses Ingram had to deal with all of the fucking garbage that she had to deal with online from from racists and from garbage. Yeah, from garbage yeah. racists. Yeah. Well, yeah. and it was it was also tough. I I really I also I appreciated that it was I found that that end I found it so so difficult to watch that scene between her and Obi Wan because it's you know we've seen unfortunately we've seen in in media in stories um, the exploitation of black women's pain right exploitation yeah. of black female trauma um black trauma in general but especially black female trauma right and so you know we get it's so well done but we do get more of it in this story and so i just i found it very difficult and very wrenching to watch and she just she does such such a beautiful job with it that um that i was really just i was blown away by you know all these people who were and of course you know some of it, some of it, one could argue is like, no, objectively, they feel like the character, the actor didn't have enough to work with, blah, blah, blah. And then some of it really was absolutely racist garbage. But, you know, by the time we get to the end here, I think she is a three dimensional character. I think absolutely. we can walk from her. And I, I really appreciated and enjoyed her performance as, as wrenching as it was. And I would, you know, and I think like just to go to the points we've been talking about already, like the fact that she allows herself a moment to talk to Obi Wan in the cave area kind of probably yeah. opens her mind up to the ability of making a choice that she makes in that other, in the final episode. Like That's true. That's she finally true. gets to speak to the man who she, in her mind, blames for everything that happened. You know, yeah, you were supposed to protect us. Where were you? And, yeah. and he's not, you know, he's, he maybe he's made, I, you know, it's hard to say exactly the emotions they're trying to convey there, but I think that's the opening to give her the decision not to kill Luke in the, in the final episode. No, well, that's very true. And actually, you're making me realize, like, that's probably the first time she has ever had the opportunity to to express that trauma to anyone. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right, actually, like that, that, that moment, where were you? You were supposed to protect us. Where were you? Well, I was riding a really cool lizard and I was chasing a robot cyborg with a zillion lightsabers. But, um, <laughs> but, um. <laughs> the things you do when you're an adult. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, what you just made me realize is that she had never probably had the chance to get that out. And that may have been sort of the uh, the crack in the door, so to speak, to lead her to do what she decides to do later. I think you're right on the money with that, actually. That's, I mean, that's a very good point. I mean, it's the first time we see her break her Sith Lord veneer to like say, where were you? Like that, like yeah, the whole yeah, she time does, she risks she risks this thing she's been working at for her entire uh, in her entire life at this point, right? She risks it to have this conversation out loud. So there's one interesting thing that you said, Chris, uh, that I want to dial in on a little bit because it's something that I think about a lot as well. This idea that Black women's trauma is very often depicted and cheaply exploited as entertainment, um, and I totally hear why you would react that way and you know full disclosure i'm a white guy uh, you're yep, a white guy yep, yep yeah that they um Worth noting so take what i'm about to say with a grain of salt but i think that i very often try to overcompensate for what i know my blind spots are same as i know you do like you try to be extra conscientious and extra aware and extra sensitive to certain things i would be surprised if there are black women who would see this as an example of exploiting black female trauma, because I think the fact that the character is really broadly more of a really kick-ass, you know, villain that's in a role where you would normally never see a black woman. And the fact that she gets to, to get into Darth Vader's face, she gets to get into to Obi-Wan Kenobi's face, she gets to sort of, you know, be calling the shots and do all this very traditionally, you know, straight white male kind of stuff. And the fact that she is three dimensional because of the backstory, because of the motivation and that that, you know, moment of trauma, that, you know, moment of her pain is, you know, really confined to sort of that moment of catharsis that that all 
good characters should have. I would be surprised if a black woman would use this as an example of that sort of phenomenon that you're talking about. I could be entirely wrong about that, but but no, I mean, I I, I didn't if if I didn't mean to give the impression that I thought this this necessarily was exploitative um, because I don't I don't think it is. I but I do think there are elements of the story that, you know, so one of the things that I think in general, we're, we're really bad at writing our aliens because yeah. so frequently our aliens uh, have human, very human motivations because that's, that's what we know, right? It's why we anthropomorphize things and animals and stuff. And, and one of the reasons I love the expanse, quick little plug for the expanse is that it, you know, what the proto molecule is doing is so, so alien that we right. kind of can't wrap our brains around it. And, and I think that's well done. Um, but, you know, that's one of the things that we have to do is even when we're writing about space wizards out in other galaxies, um, ultimately we come back to writing about things that we know so that these characters are relatable to us. And so I, while I don't think this is a situation in which the pain of the pain and the trauma of black women specifically is necessarily exploited for the sake of the story, because as you say, she's also playing a character she doesn't normally get to play, which I, I sort of want to return to for in a moment. Um, there's still an element of when you look at she, she is played by the inquisitor who is painted as very white. She is played by Vader who is also white. She ends up being a pawn in this whole game. And I think that while this was not written about race, I don't think it was. I do think it's striking that once again, you have this, this young black girl who grows up with all this trauma, carries it into adulthood, and she's still getting played by, um, she's still getting played by the people in power. She's still part of this game that they're playing. So that is certainly, yes, no, no, that is certainly a very good point. And I do think that the resulting optics of that are a little, um, are a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I don't, this is not me. I, this is for anybody out there who feels though I may be calling out of Uncle Obi, please. Please don't mistake it for that. I'm not, I don't, I'm not calling out Obi-Wan Kenobi. It did make me feel uncomfortable, but I thought in a good way that they told the story. Um, and, and as a, a, a producer of, of nine years for my own theater company, um, you know, there were uncomfortable conversations I had with actors sometimes because I'd be casting a show and, and the, the, the cornerstone of the theater company I started was about uh, domestic and sexual violence prevention. And there are a lot of, uh, race-based myths that that were perpetuated by white people as a form of control um all wrapped up in the ideas of domestic and sexual violence yeah. um you know such as what you know the 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 dark-skinned rapist who the stranger who who jumps out of the bushes um right. you know that's that's not true uh so it's it's things like that 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 i had to be thoughtful of when casting these roles that said you know, I also had the kind of conversations with the actors because sometimes the main part in a play is the abuser. And right. so at that point, you know, am I now, what am I doing if I've cast a white woman in the role of the survivor of the violence, you know, for optics and for the, the sake of statistical relevance and, and, uh, truth, you know, the, the attacker, the abuser should be a white guy that knows her. Right but now, am I discriminating against people of color for these roles? But also, what kind of message are we saying? So, like, you can't get it all right, and um, and I don't think the intention was to to profit off of black female trauma. I only bring that up because I know that is extremely common, and I didn't sure. think this was a an example of that. But it it did hit like uncomfortable for me personally. It did hit uncomfortably close to the mark of okay. I'm really glad that they fleshed out this character. And that she got to make the choices and have the agency that she had. It's not like Obi-Wan got to her in time and then talked to her before she killed Luke and she made the decision, right? She had already made the decision not to kill him. Right, exactly. But she yeah. has agency that I think in a lot of other stories, uh, as a black woman, she would have been robbed of. Even if it's just him showing up in time to stop her and then trying to convince her instead of stopping her by force. Which like, okay, it's still her decision, but it's made it. It, but it's but it's with interference, whereas she came to that conclusion on her own. She has Luke captured at her mercy. She's going to be able to get away. And she's the one who walks out of the desert carrying him while he is still alive. Obi-Wan doesn't get there in time. 
And that was something that I really appreciated that towards the end of the series, I felt like this woman's character was really given the agency to make her own decisions. And she had been robbed of that basically her entire life, first by the Jedi and then by the Inquisitors and the Sith. So, um, so I I'm sorry if I came across as me saying that this was exploitative. I don't think it was. I think it was close enough that I felt uncomfortable sitting with it. No, that's not what I thought you were saying. I was just saying that for the benefit of any of our of our sure for our listeners yeah yeah for our listeners who may not sort of understand exactly the ins and outs of the issues here but sure, you know, it's sure. also oh, but you know it's also interesting like similarly to avoid that moment of discomfort should they have cast a non-black actor right right yeah those are the hard, those are the really really hard decisions yeah so ultimately the end of the day is no because like that's such a small part of the character that's not what is going on uh, you know, in that scene, like it does. But, like but, but to that end, I also do think they were aware of the optics because there was only one evidently. And we, and I don't know for certain, cause I didn't, I didn't look into what ethnicity he is, but there's only one inquisitor who presents as white in their makeup. And that's the grand inquisitor. Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's true. true. So yeah, they do. Yeah, so true. they only have one, what looks like a white guy. And he is, you know, he, he is pale, just like the other inquisitors. Um, but one is, one is a woman, one is, is, uh, is an Asian guy. And then there's, and then there's Riva and then you've got the grand inquisitor. Right. Um, so I, I do think they were very, very, and, and you can't, at this point, Obi-Wan is a white guy. Vader is a white guy. We already know this, uh, Leia is a white woman. Um, but I do think they were very deliberate and I'd, I'd be surprised if I was wrong. I think they were very deliberate in who in the ethnicity of the actors they cast for the for the various inquisitors i mean yeah i would say you're right about that um at the risk of going entirely off the rails here um you make me think of something that i struggle with with new star wars both the sequel films and also the disney plus series that are set in the time of the original trilogy um you know there's a reading of the original trilogy where the bad guys the empire they're all white dudes. Uh, they're all white men, right? And the rebels, by comparison, are more diverse. Um, there are, you know, still mostly white men, but there are more people of color and there are more women. I'm thinking of Return of the Jedi with, you know, Mon Mothma and with, with um, some of the, the other pilots and certainly more species. There are no, no aliens serving in the Empire in the original trilogy. Um, right. And I think that's definitely very intentional. I think it's saying something about the nature of fascism and who traditionally holds the power and and tries to turn the world into a fascist state in order to maintain that racial and gender hierarchy. But things get a little muddled once you get to the prequels and the original trilogy era shows where you have Imperial officers and stormtroopers who are women and yep. are are people of color, which, you know, for a couple of reasons, like, like I, I totally get why. I mean, you don't want to put out a casting call that says, you know, we're only looking for white guys because like you're closing opportunities for so many, so yeah. many starving actors. So, I mean, that's just a practical thing. And then that reading of the original trilogy, which is certainly there. And again, I'm, I'm fairly certain it is 100% intentional. Um, could you imagine the uproar, especially in certain online spaces? I mean, on certain news networks, quite frankly, if the bad guys in these in these movies and these shows were nothing but white guys. Yeah. Right. Which is another reason why I think they they avoid it. But but it's just it's just something that I have noticed and having had some brief interactions with some fans, both women and people of color and stuff. They they don't like seeing themselves represented in the Empire. So, and I should say, not across the board, but that's something that I've heard, you know, several times. Mm -hmm. The idea that that as a function of this, like, sort of Hollywood, you know, liberal wokeness, like, we have a rainbow cast of characters. See, see, like, we have, have women stormtroopers and we have people of color who are running Star Destroyers and blowing up the good guys. Like, um, right. for some who, who are members of those groups, they don't like that. Because one of the reasons that the original trilogy really rings true to them 
is mm-hmm. that is that that's what the white guys yes the em- it's, yeah, the empire is white and male yeah so 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 that's just an interesting wrinkle that i've never had occasion to verbalize and i don't really think there is a good solve you know frankly just just because of the practical matter of i think it's more important to get the actors the opportunities the paid work so that so that they can have careers in this industry mm-hmm. well i mean not to speak to anybody you know, who's feeling that way because it's, it's, you know, it's all valid. I would say if you look at the original trilogy, though, all the people who are in that boardroom on the Death Star are all, all are all white men. Yeah. And anybody else who's not in that boardroom, if they're of a different, you know, nationality, gender, race, um, they didn't make it up that high. So, so you could say like some of that is still in place because the people in power are still the older white guys and yeah. anyone else who doesn't fit that mold is still working at the Empire. They just didn't make it that high. Except for maybe like Grand Admiral Thrawn, and he wasn't in the original trilogy in terms of canon as of right now. So um, I think that yeah. their argument yeah. still kind of stands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose that's a way to headcanon it. But even if you look at like people, you know, standing around in the hallways and on the bridge of the Executor and the, the everyone on the Death Star, I defy you to do a freeze frame. I defy you to, uh, to find <laughs> one one person of color or one female presenting face on the screen. I I would bet all the money I have that you would not find a single one. Oh, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying in terms of canonizing it for people who, you know, choose to see Star Wars a certain way, that you could still think of it that way because it's, you know. Sure. No, I mean, what you're no. saying, totally, it's it's valid, James. It totally, it totally yeah. makes sense. And, and I think that, you know, again, differing perspectives come from what Josh was talking about earlier, which is it can be easy to recognize it for, you know, especially, you know, for, for someone like me and, and Josh, I feel like you and I are kind of in the same boat here uh, in, in recognizing our own privilege to to voice it so uh, so vehemently that it's it sometimes we can also be waved off a little bit, too, um, in terms of in terms of what we think. But it's it's tough because. You know, Josh, you as a filmmaker and, and myself as a producer and director, um, these are the tough calls that need to be made sometimes that we don't, you know, you can't make in a vacuum that it's not just what sometimes what serves the story. Uh, you, we can't think about it in a vacuum. We have to think about what serves the story in in greater uh, cultural context. Absolutely. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like you said, like there is no easy answer. There are a lot of factors. And like at the end of the day, like you just have to be as thoughtful as you can. I try to I try to go to people who are actual, you know, members of the groups in question and just try to get their two cents if they're willing. I know that that's asking them to do extra labor for my own understanding. But I have some friends who, you know, who are always happy to give me their two cents. But I mean, it's not easy and it's not supposed to be. But I think you just try to be as thoughtful as you can and try to make the best call you can make at the time and acknowledge when you messed up and learn from it. Yeah, I I agree. That's a good sentiment. That's a great sentiment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, James, you asked me a question, I think the day after the finale aired, that I haven't satisfactorily answered myself. Why didn't Obi-Wan kill Vader? Oh, yeah. Well, we've been wrestling with that. I mean, I, I talked to text with message with John about that. I think a message with Jack about that. I'm not sure. But yeah. Um, well, I mean, I don't, I mean, Actually, John and I had a good conversation via text, and I think you brought this up maybe on your podcast too, Josh, but I, I can't remember since, again, I've had so many conversations about the show with different people. I sometimes lose track, and, or it could be Chris and I, but yeah, I was a little confused writing-wise why he left it, like just left him like that, because, you know, arguably Vader was the most vulnerable and he could have taken the opportunity to take him out then. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of now having a month to reflect about it and having conversations with with all the people I've had conversations with. I, I think I'm on just on the board on the message that it wasn't he didn't want to he, he doesn't want to kill anymore if he doesn't have to. I mean, you can argue that not killing Vader or killing Vader could have saved a lot of ang- angst and trauma that was coming to the universe going forward. But you also I feel like. Part of it's like when we talked about in the Redemption of Vader episode, it's it's part of it is uh, maybe it just that's not the will of the Force. You know, Obi-Wan was going with the will of the Force and Anakin is the chosen one. And that's very complex and hard to understand. And and that's why he didn't kill him. I don't know if there's a satisfying answer, but I'm still like, that's kind of where my head is at, at this point. I think I, for me, it was almost um, it, it wasn't something that like that bothered me. And maybe it's because I didn't put too much thought into it. 
but I think Ben finally, he struggles with, I think, what it means to be a Jedi and what the Jedi have done and the choices that they've made that have brought them to this point. And I have to wonder if some of his decision is not based in this, this notion that he doesn't want to kill anymore, especially after, um, especially after the conversations that he has had over the course of this series and what he's learned. Um, maybe it's, maybe it's will the force for me. And I, I think that's a compelling, that's a compelling argument, James. And that's something that I could, I could latch into and, and frankly appropriate for myself. Um, for me, I think it was, I mean, a, I, well, I was, no, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I don't want to cop out in saying that. And I'm, I'm no, sorry, I didn't no, mean to cut you off. I'm just, I'm just saying like, you know, we can argue like, why was Vader allowed to live so long and do all the things? Well, like some of it is like, it's, I guess the will of the force and that's bringing the balance to the force because he is the chosen one. So but I don't think you're copping out. I think that makes sense. And in a, in a strictly Jedi way, it actually, it actually makes sense because it's sort of a frustrating answer of like, why didn't you kill Vader when you had the chance? Because he's the chosen one. That's the will of the force. Well, what are you on about? Like, how many times have we been wrong about this? So I actually think that your your reasoning for it holds a lot more water than mine does. Mine is simply that the war fatigue it's, has set in, and he does not want to be responsible for another death. Um, that's I, For me, I think that was when I was watching, that was what I was able to walk away with, was the harder thing was to not kill Vader. And he decided he didn't want to be a part of that war anymore. Well, I, I think you're right, James. I think I, I like I like the way you've laid it out. I actually agree with you, Chris. I I don't think that's the weaker argument. I think he, though I don't necessarily know that I would characterize it as the harder choice, but I do think he just didn't want to murder somebody. He spent the last decade carrying the guilt of thinking that he had killed his friend, brother, son. Um, and I think it was an emotional moment that they just had. And I think he just didn't want to kill anymore. And that's something that I, I really understand. Though, though I will say the only reason why it just kind of nags at me a little bit is because it, it would have been very easy to contrive a reason why they would be separated all of a sudden and it was no longer an option to end the fight, right? Like at the end of The Force Awakens when the planet sure. is falling apart and there's like the chasm opens up between them and they can't fight. But the other thing that I have to admit is that when watching it the first time, never crossed my mind that that, that was an issue. Like like it didn't feel weird. Like I was so I was so caught up in the moment of what was happening. It just felt so right. I was so compelled. And honestly, the thought, the question never even entered my mind until James, you asked me the next day. And, and I was like, Oh, huh? Yeah. And I mean, of course the real answer is because he has to be in the next movie. Right. Right. I but, mean, uh, the, an the answer is all the toys of the back in the toy box for a new hope. So yeah. Yeah. But that but, said, <laughs> uh, but that said, I do think that there is something to the idea that, um, you know, there will be no more killing today sort of thing. I mean, Anakin knows he's been beaten. Right. And, yeah. and Obi-Wan, he has a mission and there's a plan. And if he all of a sudden took out Vader, what would that do to the state of the universe? And I think he has, you know, really accepted his role of laying low and biding his time and leaving this problem to solve for the generation that will come next. Yeah, I mean, that's that's fair. I mean, listen, it's it, there's plenty of stories. And, I mean, I can't think of specific ones off the top of my head, but like where the, the soldier decides not to kill anymore or lays down his, I mean, Obi-Wan didn't lay down his weapon, but, you know, as far as we know, after, after the Clone Wars and after episode three, we don't see him killing anybody else. I mean, he takes a guy's arm off in the cantina, but that's, he did, you know, the guy, you know, was being disruptive. But <laughs> aside, aside from taking a, a person's limb, we don't see him kill any stormtroopers or kill anybody else after that. So maybe, you know, that's a good way to look at it too. He's, he's done with killing. He'll still fight and defend people, but he's not going to, you know, just outright murder people anymore. Which is the Jedi way. A uh, Jedi's weapon is for, no. 
uh, knowledge and powers. Defense. Yeah. Knowledge and defense. Yeah. Knowledge and defense, never for attack. Though, I, right. though I will, that was on my mind when that awesome moment that everyone is constantly posting all over social media where Obi-Wan is like flinging rocks at Vader. Like that, that actually crossed my mind in that moment. Like, wait a second, he's going on like major offense here. That said, like <laughs> that's in the context of a fight that he needs to survive and he needs to win. So, so it's also uh, it's, with against an opponent he knows can take it. I mean, it's not like Vader like can't, like he's matching force against force, I should say. Vader has the same yeah. amount of ability and anger and rage. And let me just like just clarify because I said you know he doesn't want to murder anymore. I'm not suggesting Obi Wan was ever a murderer. I am just saying like he yeah, killed yeah. a lot of yeah 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 yeah, killed, yeah yeah yeah. He killed a lot of people in the Clone Wars. I mean you know a lot of people died. The Jedi killed a lot of people in the Clone Wars. Yeah, put it they that, did that way. You know they weren't just they weren't all droids. They were there were other sentient beings that the Jedi took out, maybe not directly, but things exploded and things happened. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, just to kind of, rec you know, you know, reiterate, Obi-Wan's done with killing, not murdering. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, you're absolutely, and, and, you know, I think that's, because that's one of the things I, one of the things I appreciate about the, appreciate about the Clone Wars series is, is Yoda grappling with the realization that the Jedi are the ones who have screwed this up. Yes, they're manipulated. And yes, there's stuff going on outside of their knowledge, but, but they they charge into this war and they do not use the force for knowledge and defense, right? They absolutely use it to attack. Um, and and so the Jedi have come up short and Yoda struggles with with the choices they made that got them to this point. And um, and I think we need that. I think it's in the sixth, the fifth or the sixth season of Clone Wars. Um, so the, the penultimate season um, where he's where he's personally struggling with this and he and he starts to to lose faith in what they've done. And, um, and I, you know, I think that's, that's part of it too, is, is Obi-Wan also having that, that realization of, of, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to do that anymore, especially now that he's seen what it's like. He, he really just wanted to be on the planet with Luke. Right. And then his world got a little bit bigger when he found out what an extraordinary person Leia is. No, I, I agree with that, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, like I said, I, I feel, like I said, I feel like, you know, the, the Jedi, like, I agree with everything you said. The Jedi definitely were, were not just defending in the Clone Wars. They were definitely planning attacks and points of attack to do, use that. So, you know, and again, I, I can easily sign on board with what you said and what Josh said about him just being done with fighting and with killing and with outright killing. I mean, he, he already engaged with it part of Lee and the Obi-Wan uh, in the series when he was fighting the stormtroopers on that base. So I think he just reached the point where he's done, especially when he had the burden of like knowing like, I didn't do this to Anakin, Anakin did it to himself. No, and not only that, like, uh, like, look, at the end of the day, I know he lets him live because of plot reasons and really he probably should have ended him then. But that said, I will never fault someone for choosing not to kill somebody. I just can't. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, it's just, I mean, just to bring him up again, like, you know, Batman should have killed, could have killed the Joker many times, and he didn't. And uh, you know, and that story keeps going on and on. So it's 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 something that happens in hero stories. Just to go back to the hero myth, there are sometimes the villain that outright the hero should kill, and they don't, and that is that is the choice that they make at that time. Do you guys think this should have been a movie uh, versus a series? No, I, I think the I mean, I like the series too because I don't know if we would have gotten the stuff with Reva like we did that we talked about in the movie. I feel like, unfortunately, just to kind of not to rehash everything we just talked about, but I think her stuff would have been cut in favor of the Obi Wan Vader stuff and the Baru and you know and the Lars Homestead stuff. Might have, I think a lot of the stuff that we like to give greater character development outside the legacy characters would have been cut. So I think I like the series. I think it needs to be what it is. I did not like the original. I did not like the original Dune movie, but the miniseries, Frank Herbert's Dune that they had on sci-fi, I thought was wonderful. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, that was in three parts. I think Obi-Wan Kenobi, as much as I think of it as a movie, I think it needs to be a series in order to, uh, there's stuff, that, there's fat that could be trimmed, but I thought it needs to be a series to do what it did. Yeah. I would agree with that as well, because I think it's so character driven that the first thing that you lose when you're editing a movie is you trim the character moments because ultimately the movie has to flow and make logical sense and all fit together. So so I feel like a lot of those uh, really lovely moments that are some of my favorite scenes, like especially a lot of the stuff with Obi-Wan and Leia, 
was about to say Han and Leia. Um, a lot of the stuff between Obi Wan and Leia, a lot of those little moments, those like little scenes between Obi Wan and things like, I think we probably would have lost a lot of that. Though I will say that, like, when I think about the show in my mind, I have a hard time kind of visualizing it in my head. And I think a part of that has to do with, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into it because I've said this, I've talked about this ad nauseum on our wrap up of Obi Wan that we did on my show. So you can go listen to that. Like, I think some of that has to do with like the literal kind of muddiness that's a product of the luminance of the volume stage but it's also like i mean this is a tv series it's longer and it's harder to reduce it to a series of iconic images of the same way that you can a film so so i don't think that that's necessarily a strike against it it was just something that i thought was sort of interesting to realize no definitely definitely um yeah i think i think it works good as a series um and like everything you guys said, I think I think we would have lost some good stuff if it had been a movie just because of time purposes and the series allows it to breathe. And to your point, Chris, I think I would also, this is probably something I will revisit at some point too. Of, of the series that have come out, I will probably revisit Obi-Wan at some point. So yeah, um, same. So I think we covered everything we wanted to cover. I mean, there's probably more we could cover, but I think this is probably there's a good- There's always uh, more, but again, head over to the trash compactor because- <laughs> Again, that that episode by episode really lets us dig into some of the nitty gritty. Um, yes, and uh, like it's been a couple of those episodes. So yeah, go check out Trash Compactor. Yes, oh, thank you, Chris. I was gonna I say, it. I was gonna say you were you were you uh, were in some of those episodes, and um, yeah, please check out the Trash Compactor for a deeper dive into all this. But um, as we wrap this up, I want to thank the listening audience for being here with us. Thank you for listening to everything we had to say, and uh, if you have thoughts and comments about what we said, please make them in the Facebook group, or you can always reach us at uh, secretoriginsmc at gmail.com. Uh, but as always, I, I couldn't do the show if not for my other hosts. So thank you, Chris. Always my pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Josh, thank you for coming back. Goodbye there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Must Sorry. Wait. He, he's been waiting to do that for so no, long. No, it, it literally just occurred to me. No. I, I am I, I want to make it clear. It just it just popped in there. What? What, what just popped what just in, popped in, in sorry, there? Sorry, sorry. Oh my god, what's happening? I'm a little upset with you. You didn't trust us to finish that for you. <laughs> Not trust. I just I just get started. I can't help myself. And and by the way, audience, we have a great Ghostbusters one and two part thing in case because uh, you haven't picked up all the Ghostbuster references in this episode, too. So I'd go back and watch, listen to those episodes also. Might as well promote that. That's right. Um, <laughs> all the references. I mean, just, what other ones? What other ones did I miss? <laughs> aside, aside from our, our Star Wars references that were in here. And uh, I don't think we had any Star Trek ones in this, in this episode. Though there's I mentioned still time, the Expanse. You all can go back to the sci-fi episode. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. At the end of this episode here, we're just going to plug everything we've done on this feed so far and, and Josh's feed. So and look we'll for our upcoming it. West Wing episode. Yes. <laughs> no, but seriously, we should do that, Chris. We should. I, I uh, agree with you. I, yeah. I, I wasn't being facetious. I'm in. Uh, I better start watching the West Wing. Um, that's, right. that's right. It's only eight seasons. <laughs> that's it. I'm still working on the Expanse. Only, but... only... No, it's only seven seasons, and it's actually only four seasons. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, well, we're, them, them's fighting words. I'm looking forward to getting into it. Oh, okay, well, you and, can go fuck yourself. <laughs> there it is. And Josh, the, just to let Josh, just to say that, like, I, I really, I was hoping it, if I was I, uh, hoping to be on that last episode you did of Obi Wan Kenobi, uh, but I, I, but I'm glad we got to do this. And I was toying if I had been on that episode when you introduced me of saying uh, the line, "You may dispense with the pleasantries. I'm here to put you back on schedule." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, next time, please use that. I was never like, waste a good if, bit. No, Never waste no. a good bit. Um, so with that audience, uh, we're going to wrap up this episode uh, of <laughs> Secret Origins on Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, again, we're in, we're in Facebook, the Facebook group. Uh, we have email. We're on Instagram. And uh, thank you for listening. And we will talk to you next time. <laughs>